So here's this, okay? And this really caught my eye earlier this week. And I basically want to share this with you since, you know, Monday. And, you know, construction trader talk, ETH talks about this whole thing of, you know, basically what quant does and how it fixes this whole thing. So it's the current landscape, landscape like it says, a crypto and its problems. It's a thread. And I'm going to show you guys this thread. Um, one thing I want to point out is when we talk about like TCP IP, even with BSV, there's the whole thing of IPv6. So I'm going to do a little compare and contrast. And if anything, it's going to be a good outline for you guys to understand um, the bigger picture of things, at least in my opinion, their opinion as well. So we're going to share this. Like I says, it is a thread. So crypto and a blockchain face interoperability issues. We know that, you know, and that's, of course, one of the main highlights that's been mentioned for quant for the longest time. But look what it says. Hindering seamless communication across different platforms as to pre-TCP IP era in computing. First, let's understand TCP IP. But check this out. It's not going to be boring. It's actually very educational. And look at what shows here. You have all these different layers. And when you see the demo tonight from Quant himself, they break some of this down. Even um, I have some research from Tokenizer. Shout out to him. You know, he does an excellent job breaking some of this down. But this thread, if you weren't aware of it, I wasn't aware of it. I always thought that TCP IP started with the Internet Engineering Task Force back in like 1984. We're talking about the pioneers of the Internet. In this thread, well, TCP IP apparently was born in 1974. That's interesting. You know, we look at like that's 50 years ago for crying out loud revolutionized digital communication by enabling different networks to connect and share data before this computers could barely talk across different platforms exactly like it is with crypto today you know when you hear the terms of like you're so early you know sometimes you just need to look at it from a broader view have a little history lesson if you will there's this whole thing of you know the issues in regards to this pre tcp ip era Computing was, of course, fragmented, proprietary, uh, proprietary, proprietary, I can't pronounce, tomato, tomato, right? Some people say I can't pronounce certain things. Whatever. There's one particular guy, he knows who he is. He says, I always say sediment instead of sentiment. Tomato, tomato. All right. Proprietary protocols meant networks were isolated. This is back to the whole thing of Gilbert Reverdy and talking about your isolated, you know, walled gardens or your silos. Right. So it made <clears throat> cross communication a major hurdle. Digital landscape was like isolated islands. And then, of course, there was the whole thing of ARPANET. You know, like, I don't know if you guys ever seen that show. Uh, great show, by the way. It was called, you know, The Americans. It was on FX. Um, I think one like five or six seasons. Really, really cool show. I'd highly recommend seeing it. But one thing that was brought up in that show was ARPANET. And a lot of people still to this day consider the first internet that was, you know, they thought it was created by, the, you know, the Soviet Union, um, you know, during the Russian, um, that particular era, right, of, of the 80s. But in 1983, when ARPANET adopted TCP IP, it set the stage for modern internet. This shift marks the beginning of a new era in computing, breaking down barriers between disparate networks going more into this and there's of course you know going to get into some of the real juicy stuff in a bit but there was this whole thing of more of these issues all right and that was the post tcp ip era the world saw a surge in innovation email the world wide web right www ftp file transfer protocol if you're wondering that what that means um i used to have a ftp with you know my gaming group dpg for the longest time but there is more protocols that flourished and, you know, branched out to do bigger things. This was thanks to, of course, interoperability with TCP, TCP IP that was offered. The Internet became a global village transforming society and commerce. But in reality, that was going from that era to, for instance, Web 1. You guys lived through Web 1. It wasn't the most interoperable uh, network out there. You know, you have your CompuServe, you have your AOLs, you have some of these other ones. And... They're not really talking to each other. Um, if anything, it may seem like it once you got finally to a particular web page. But as far as the user experience, again, the whole thing of siloed 
or silos, right? Um, and then have what they call the walled gardens. You know, it's like that's not what we want. Where we're getting to here now and also in the near future is the beauty of what Web3 can provide. A little bit more in regards to this thread. Um, Today, TCP IP is still the backbone in regards to the internet, supporting billions of devices worldwide. Its adoption turned the internet from a niche technology into a global infrastructure. As you see in this thread, when we get more and more into it, or even with the research that we've had in the past, you have to keep in mind one key thing and one key element, the narrative, right? It's not just, you know, saying, hey, here's the information and it's this way because... But when I look at quant from the broader perspective, I come to the conclusion that if TCP IP is the backbone of the internet, then quant is definitely going to be what? The backbone of Web3. And how valuable can that be? You know, um, I've seen other people in the past, uh, you know, shout out to a lot of these other researchers, right? Um, you know, for instance, Cypress to Manicor, right? He has mentioned some of these things in regards to how neat would it have been to be able to invest in Bluetooth technology um, instead of just using the technologies back in the day, right? I kind of look at quant in that new light, that new perspective. You do have that chance to finally be able to invest in these technologies that are the backbone of the new era of the internet. As literally, if this is your first time ever watching or hearing about quant, that's one way I look at it, all right? In conclusion, crypto today is where computing was before. TCP IP, for instance, fragmented and complex. Interoperability is key for a unified digital economy, according to this guy, Wealth Transfer Nico. I should give him a follow. This is a big thread. You know, thank you to him. I'll give him a tag when this gets chopped up. But you got to keep in mind, interoperability, like I said, is key for a unified digital economy. Quant references that quite a bit. We are just at the beginning. I would say that's true. And there's going to be huge potential. And it could be, you know, more than anybody's ever seen in regards to things taken off in regards to market cap. How do we know that? Well, look what happened originally with BTC. I mean, you know, uh, if you go to CMC as we speak, you know, it says that the all-time lows back in 2010 was a little over four cents. And it blew up to 69K per you know, Bitcoin, BTC on 11-11-2021. What happens when you get something with way more tech and, and it's tied to literally everything? How much would that literally be worth? You know, for the naysayers that say this can never get to anything huge, you know, quant is just an ERC-20 token. It tells me they haven't taken more of a deeper dive into it because we do know that quant is blockchain agnostic and we do know that if ETH was to go down, the whole network was to go down, well, the demo from Overledger basically shows that you can instantly go with any other particular blockchain, like, for example, the XRPL, and do what? Settle with real-time growth settlements in that particular coin or token. So I love what this guy had, and I do agree, you know, like, all this represents a new wave in regards to blockchain, DLT, and so on, aiming to solve major hurdles and unify the crypto world. Again, never forget some of these concepts, the unification of how this all works. We're no longer in that era anymore in regards to, you know, silos. <clears throat> what we're into is full-scale interoperability. And again, this brings me to the next part, scaling and so on. So I want to show you guys this and this is straight from the quant network all right if you're not following the quant network you definitely you're welcome to do so you can follow me at quant underscore network 143 you know thousand uh followers but they are still very very of course proud to talk about um the publishing of their case study in regards to project rosalind i've done uh, you know a lot of research posted it shared it with you guys but it's not just you know, rehashing the same thing. And in this case study, there's a lot more, even with visuals. So we're going to get into all of this, okay? And I want to basically get into this first. This is straight from the quant network. And like you see right here, 
quants work on the digital pound. We've seen quants work, for instance, digital euro. And we're also seeing quants work on what, guys? The digital dollar. How do we know that? Have a blast from the past. Understand the greater picture of things. When we talk about quant, you will see that they are very, very into what is going to be considered the new money. This is from Andrew Carrier. We know that he is the, the big wig when it comes to marketing for quant. Three key things that are tagged here from February 12th. And again, I wish I could have shared that with you right on that particular day. Had some issues, obviously, with the internet and so on, but we're, you know, got that solved. You guys are here for this. So Bank of International Settlements tagged. Bank of England, of course, CBDC. The far right side says, we prove that APIs could play a key role in enabling CBDC systems to deliver a range of benefits, terms, payments, functionality, and of course, security. Directed by the BIS Hub London Center project, Rosalind was an experiment that explored the development of a retail central bank digital currency. It tested how application programming interfaces, which are called APIs, if you ever wonder what that meant, could facilitate retail payments and CBDCs and support, um, so, excuse me, support the exploration of innovative CBDCs use cases. They have this whole thing back that they did you know, to last summer, June 2023, in which they did, in fact, announce their role in regards to all this as part of a vendor team for Project Roslyn. The project looked at a public-private sector collaboration model in which the public sector would provide the core infrastructure and the private sector would produce consumer-facing applications. It revealed the key role APIs is enabling CBDC systems to deliver a range of benefits in terms of payments, functionality, and security. I did want to state this real quick before we get more into this. You need to treat quant, especially if you're new to all this, that they come out with their announcements when they feel like coming out with their announcements. And what I mean by that is a lot of times when people look more into quant, they don't see everything that's on the surface. They say, you know, all these things of whether it's me or other researchers and so on, all you guys do is connect the dots, but I haven't seen anything solid mentioned from the team. You got to keep in mind, we were covering a lot of these things. There's obviously NDAs, non-disclosure agreements and so on, where they can't officially come out with all of it. Well, consistently, whether it's myself, Tokenizer, um, Quant Papa, heck, a lot of these other guys I mentioned, right? We have consistently mentioned to everyone, look more into Quant. Here's why this connects to that. I don't think this is nothing burger. Checking out the whole thing of, you know, Project Hamilton. We legitimately have the quant network working with, for instance, MIT. We have, you know, these other things going on with the Federal Reserve. And a lot of times, like, people from the outside kind of come after us and say, no, that's not true. Yes, guess what? It's been solidified. It is true. But it's not a whole thing of, hey, trying to pat myself on the back with the research. What I want people to understand is even with what you see right here, Quant is still doing other things for the future leading up, right, that haven't been confirmed yet. They're also still part of many, many different NDAs. And we'll always do our best to bring the material and say to everybody, hey, look, this is how it all connects. This is why it's so big. This is why it's such a big deal. <clears throat> Today, not specifically today, but on the 12th, Quant did mention they were pleased to announce this whole thing of their details in regards to the work on this industry-leading digital currency project, the core API layer. Now, I wish I could put a full screen on this. Um, it doesn't allow me to particularly do that, but I will come out of the frame, and I want to share some of this with you guys. It's uh, a little bit under five minutes, but it's definitely worth paying attention to if you haven't seen it. There's been a lot of theory done on CBDCs. There's been a lot of economic analysis, but this was the first time they're actually testing it with real applications, real payments, and real use cases that represented what people and businesses use. Project Rosalind's objectives were for the Bank of England and the Bank of International Settlement to understand what a CBDC means 
for banks, institutions, payment organizations, and fintechs in a real world setting. We actually created a new form of money. We were able to create a new form of escrow, a digital escrow. We saw firsthand participants like the Central Bank of Canada, Amazon, Barclays, MasterCard, use this innovative escrow technology that we built to create new types of payments and new types of flows. What made Project Rosalind so successful was that it was very, very driven by, by end users. They engaged the API users and some, some big folks and some small folks early on and continuously throughout the project, and they still are doing. And that focus on what is it that end users want, why will they find it useful, actually is a massive contributor to project success, right? It, it, it means there's a reason for the project to happen, which is not the case with all blockchain projects. It was very, very iterative. Every week we were coming up with new requirements. Every week we were producing new demos and we had really strong participation from, from the Bank of England, from BIS, from everybody. And the project was like an absolute dream, right? It was the best project we've worked on. It was truly agile. We're receiving requirements, shipping a build, receiving feedback from users within a two week span. It's something that not you don't get very often in projects or products that you're getting user feedback within two weeks of getting the requirements. So that by itself was, was exhilarating. Quant's technology for Project Rosalind essentially provides the technological foundation of the entire project itself. A big part of our contribution to that was Overledger, um, our technology, and that made everything much smoother and much faster. If we'd been building against a regular blockchain um, and integrating with it directly, we would never have been able to do it in six months. The whole idea of Project Rosalind was to create a whole bunch of APIs that businesses and banks could use to interact with CBDCs. Those APIs actually talk to Overledger and interact with the blockchain via Overledger. So we literally provide the technological foundation for interacting with blockchain. The other area where we contributed a lot was in our smart contract expertise. We built the smart contracts for this, which are quite complex central bank digital currency smart contracts. And that's a kind of a credit to the folks on our tech team. The main challenges in Project Rosalind were around kind of defining exactly what do we mean by a CBDC, right? So there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. It could be decentralized, it could be centralized. And so some of those big decisions um, needed to happen quite early on. The other challenge that we had was um, around offline payments. Offline payments are just technically difficult and it took us longer than we expected to work through how that works. We were successful in the end, but it took a while. We had so many different requirements to cater for um, and taking those diverse requirements and diverse use cases and boiling that down into a simple set of APIs that would suit everyone um, was a design challenge in itself. To then take those APIs and build them rapidly um, was a fun challenge, but a challenge nonetheless. The learning outcomes from this project for us were, have been really quite transformative. So there was the big thing with uh, retail CBDC is, so what? Right? Well, what's the point of this? And Project Rosalind came up with some really, really good answers to that, um, which were kind of collaborative through the whole process. Um, but actually they've, they've given us a lot of clarity in terms of how that should work and that's, that's affected some of our other propositions. We have kind of laid the groundwork for how Quant wants to do projects going forward. There was a huge amount of collaboration and it was an absolute joy to work with everybody. Plus internally within our teams, it challenged us to work quicker uh, and collaborate internally within Quant as well. Um, so honestly it was a joy. Okay, obviously nice to share that with you guys. Um, has some more I want to get into, okay? So what you're going to see next is from Tokenizer, all right? Now, there is another project that I'm going to research with you guys um, probably next week, possibly tomorrow, but I'm leaning more towards next week, okay? It's called Cell Frame. Now, I'm not covering cell frame tonight, right? Which is cell. I've seen other content creators like Nick of NCash Official mentioning specifically cell. 
saying that sell is basically like getting into quant for under a dollar. All those things sound very interesting from a market cap perspective. I have to agree when it comes to this statement from the one and only tokenizer. Okay, so tokenizer basically mentions, like you see here, there is no next quant, right? There isn't. Like there's quant and then there's all the others. There could be ones that are similar to it or like getting into it, at, you know, for under a dollar, like sell frame and so on. And again, that's that's opportunity. And I will never disrespect anybody that's into it. You know, heck, I might get into it as well. It seems really like amazing, right? But look what he mentions. He's been seeing mentions of people believing that they found the next potential quant network, right? Could tokens replicate what QNT did last cycle? Absolutely. But fundamentally, there's nothing that proves to be the next, right, quant overledger. So he has this whole explanation. I'm not going to get to all of it. But some of the things that caught my eye, other than interoperability solutions and some of these other things, was what sets quant apart, like it says right here, the network itself um, from the rest isn't exactly how they enabled interoperability, but like it says, while the universal agnostic aspects through APRs are key, they are not the key differentiator. Rather, what makes quant unique to anything else is the links they have gone to basically standardize DLT. Yeah, very, very true. Interoperability, utility. Anybody with some decent coding knowledge could code up a bridge for interoperability, but to be recognized by standard bodies such as ISO, ITU, the World Economic Forum, right, and APA, and more like some of these other ones, de facto ones, you know, standard for DLT is something new and can hold up. My main key thing, again, back is to, you know, the first part of the outline. When you see things like the Internet Engineering Task Force, right, the pioneers of the Internet, and, and Gilbert Verdian, always working with standards and working groups. Think about standards, you know. Shout out to Channing. He did a really good job mentioning standards on some of his videos. <clears throat> Why is standards so, you know, interesting? Why is it so important? Think about it. Think about how a person, even if you weren't ever into crypto, ever, how many times do we use the expressions of, you know, hey, this right here, this is like the standard issue, right? Standards are important. They lay down the groundwork for what product or service you're going to be using. So to have somebody that has literally created a standard through ISO TC 307, right? That's also, you know, uh, has this whole thing with ISO 222 as well, like the enablers, but specifically ISO TC 307 the Gilbert Varian quant standard to have him create that standard. And I believe it was, you know, uh, was it 20, 2014, 2015, something like that. That in itself is huge because moving forward, it's not just he made this standard. It's also, well, there's working groups that are part of these standards. So, you know, we talk about the whole thing with Japan, and, you know, for the future, it should, you know, Jasmine and so on, ISO TC 307. You have to keep in mind that the working groups will help you get to the standard that's put into place, put into motion. So look what it says. Quant being inspired by ISO TC 307. Already seeing 40 plus countries that use the standard of ISO TC 307. Gilbert Verdian, founding the course, the whole standard, right? Okay, not 2015 or 24, 2016. Australian government, healthcare department, so on. Gilbert is, is, you know, himself grew annoyed at the fact that patient data doesn't interoperate with across systems. And I'm sure his wife, Gilbert Verdian, who works with this industry, probably, you know, said, hey, right? Here's a problem that we have. And I would agree with it. If you look more into the whole thing of health standards, it's a big problem, right? Um, in regards to the medical industry, you know, things move like you're talking about snail mail. It's worse than snail mail, you know, literally. Like I can get literally mail sent to me quicker than some of my, you know, medical records. So 
a tokenizer goes on to mention that Gilbert founded this solution right in the right time, right place. ISO was looking to become standardized blockchain for industry use. So right off the bat, Quant had eliminated the chances for competition in regards to standard grade solutions. You know, I had, a, uh, you know, Elizabeth Howard, Space Chick, she was on here, and we were talking about the whole thing of, you know, especially with ERC-20 tokens. Yeah, you can copy the code. You can talk, copy the template all you want all day long. Do you have those partnerships? Do you have these standards? And the answer would be no, right? You don't just get to copy code and get to walk away from everything and boast, hey, you got this all going. Because at the end of the day, we do put emphasis on these positive catalysts when it comes to partnerships and so on. Um, they matter for a reason. And again, you can have great utility and boast about it, but if you don't have those connections, then you really don't have anything. Laying the foundations of Overleisure, they quickly began to standardize their approach of a new layer for the Internet of Value. You're always hearing Gilbert Verde and mention those two specific things, Internet of Value, Internet of Trust. Today, we know this as Secure Asset Transfer Protocol, SATP. When I asked, you know, Tokenizer on the show, we talked about this, SATP. But both Quant, and back to the whole thing I was talking about with MIT, especially with the whole thing of Project Hamilton, not Roslyn, Hamilton, both Quant and MIT had co-authored the initial vision alongside names like IBM and even Intel. SATP with official Internet Engineering Task Force, WG Today, and expected delivery in July 2024, things are certainly looking quite bright. That race there is big. You know, people are, are, are asking, when, when are we going to have the next big thing happen with Quant? I think that could be it right there, right? But might not either, you know, just because there's new things happening, partnerships or um, some of these examples doesn't mean it's full scale mass adoption. You always got to treat this like it has to have time to have that adoption. But behind all this perfect orchestration, like it says, from Quant's very own Gilbert Verdian, you have to keep in mind that not only has Gilbert Verdian set the standard both figuratively, literally with ISO TC 307, SATP, but Gilbert's CV is something that few can match in the world of crypto. Of course, worked with the government. You guys have heard me talk about this many times uh, across other governments, not just Australia, with the UK, even the United States. Um, he led the path in regards to adoption through standardization, and he got it locked in. He brought with him these people who have a very, very impressive um, resume as well. Andrew Carrier, ex Swift head of PR. I don't think people realize that sometimes. You know, like we point out, Andrew Carrier, you know, he heads up the whole thing of marketing. But again, who is he? What background did he have? It's like, were you ever aware that he was ex Swift head of PR? So, all this whole notion that and I, I know I don't mean any bash towards the Chainlink community because I hold Chainlink as, as well. I'm not the type of guy that um, would ever like, you know, go after other communities. I think it's silly. I think it's childish personally. I really, really do. I, I think at this point, this whole thing of crypto tribalism, not just with meme tokens, but with some of these blue chips is, is just really immature. But it is worth noting that the, uh, you know, like with Chainlink, they always boast the whole thing like we have the true partnership um with swift we are you know for instance the king of oracles and i would agree with that Chainlink is the king of oracles right and they are very very proud of that direct partnership with swift and i i would mention that all the time too if i was raw 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 only uh chain link but again it doesn't get mentioned too often that you have a person that's an ex swift head of pr that is the one up because you want to know something that tells me that Swift does in fact recognize Quant. And you have seen interviews, whether it's GV himself or Martin Hargreaves talking about, yes, we've been talking to Swift. Remember Davos, uh, not 2023, but I think it was 2022 was mentioned in some of those key things. Um, Neil Smith, I've done a few deep dives about him. Uh, we want to talk about impressive resume. Ex-Comcast CEO and chairman, Guy Dietrich, you know, we talked about the Rockefellers and Quant. I don't know if you guys remember that video. Yeah, it was an old channel, but 
it's a big deal, right? We always talk about some of these big familiar names. 26 years with Morgan Stanley and also Rockefeller. Um, you even have ex Citigroup people. Remember how we talked about the whole thing of JP Morgan, Citigroup, the RLN, how it all connects? Again, guys, when you look more into the whole thing, you come to the conclusion, why does it all make sense? It's because who they are connected with, those connections, those partnerships. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Luke Riley, you always see him in those interviews. ISO, TC307, subject matter expert. Obviously, there's a whole grocery list here. But the key thing for you is the standards, the partnership, and especially this case study when it comes to specifically Project Rosalind. So there's more than meets the eye. Excellent research from Tokenizer, as usual. I want to bring you to this next part of what Tokenizer has. And this gives you not only examples that were shown from the Quant Network site, but in my opinion, Tokenizer does it better, better than anybody. He is the research GOAT, and that's why I call him the GOAT when it comes to this. It's not just quant that he researches. He researches like 20, 30 different projects, and he is so consistent with this. Um, shout out to Crypto Lulu, Lewis Jackson. He had a thing like, you know, what uh, crypto YouTuber influencer do you think is, is the GOAT? And I, you know, I didn't see anybody mention Tokenizer. I mentioned at Tokenizer. I was like, yeah, he's the GOAT because he consistently does this. And here's another great example, okay? So tokenizer mentioned this. We are now seeing more internals behind Project Rosalind detail. Right, we do. You know, it was it was so much more than what was covered a couple of years ago when we we're talking about this. But we knew about the Overledger Enable API layer system, but until now we hadn't seen the full extent of the participants. These answers were unveiled today in reality a few days ago, right? Here's the internal utilities of Rosalind, and by boy oh boy, let's take a look into this. So since Gilbert and the Bank of International Settlements' official announcement of Rosalind being successful in June 2023, we've gotten spill um, on the parties involved, right? We, we haven't gotten like all the details. You saw some of those examples in the video. This is blown up a little bit for you to understand. So all these layers, the central bank ledger layer, the far left, Gives you examples of how it's all work tied in together in regards to the simulation of a token based ledger and kicking over to the famous API ledger side of things that quant with overledger does core API ledger, ledger enabling the Rosalind sandbox. And that is huge, literally huge. The orchestration, the messaging. Think about this for a second. The messaging, you know, we're not even into full scale operation for ISO 222 when it comes to everything being fully implemented. I want you guys to understand this for a second. Think outside the box because we have not forgotten about ISO TC or ISO 222. So when we talk about orchestrators, how ISO TC 307, the quant network standard could work with obviously ISO 222, especially when it comes to the messaging layers. Understand that it's like when ISO is fully implemented, you know, look at like it's, it is a giant band. It is a giant chorus. It is a giant conglomerate of, of literally instruments, right? So you could have your, your H bars that play like, I don't know, let's use this example, a, a clarinet. You have your, uh, your stellars that play, for instance, a trumpet. You have your, um, your XRPs. That might be, you know, play various different drums, but they all play an instrument. Who is the orchestrator that will work with them to have every all this interoperability and all this stuff come together? Well, it's the ISO TC307 standard to orchestrate it. This is where the expression of the plumbing comes through. And lots, a lot of people will say, no, it's just exclusively XRP. No, that's not the case. They all work together. They all talk to each other through ISO standards. But the key thing has always been understanding certain standards. Look at this for a second. Service provider layer, Barclays, Amazon, MasterCard, Bank of Canada, Rovolut, Roadline, and this other particular one, which I can't read at the top, um, read it right now, but 
again, service provider layer. So all these layers working together <clears throat> to solve a common problem that existed all the way back during the days, even before pre-Web 1, and why that is huge. Into this next part of what we have, Project Rosalind in Numbers. Were you aware that there's over 500,000 API calls made, 33 new API endpoints created, six functional categories defined, one new form of a smart payment invented? That's crucial. 7,652 notifications generated, 1,595 errors made and sent and logged, right? Everything needs to be verifiable and, if anything, fixed. I mean, can you imagine if we were still using the MT messaging layer of um, just Swift, how slow this would move? It says a wide ecosystem of five private companies developed new products on the platform through intense collaboration <clears throat> with external partners. We had developed a unique CBDC smart contract specifications containing over 25 functions and over 25 supporting APIs in Overledger. So here's another example. Let's jump back to this for a second. Look at the far left side of this servicing provider layer. The expression of at some point, these guys from Amazon or MasterCard or you know your Aunt May or whoever swiping their debit card, they don't understand it could be very well tied into crypto, right? Because we do have the enablers ready set in the standard to standardize all of how this works. And you don't think there's going to be tremendous value with that? You don't think that that would have way more value for the future? I'm not talking about right this instant, you guys. But for the future of the new monetary system, this new shift, and you better believe it's a radical shift. And not to mention, QNT has what, guys? 14.88 million tokens. BTC has, was it like 21, 22 million? And don't get me wrong, I mean, you know, both are, represent scarcity and you know, that's always worth pointing out. But as far as scarcity goes, QNT definitely takes the cake when it comes to that. This part real quick, and boy, oh boy, Tokenizer did an excellent job giving us the highlights. So I'm just going to get into the, the blue highlights. The opportunity to apply this programmability that we have outlined here to create innovative new products that differentiate themselves from challengers and competitors of almost is almost endless. Endless. Think about that for a second. You know, the few uh, of the um, the Internet of value, there's so much value here. The Internet of trust. Some people have issues when it comes to the whole thing about CVCs. But I think the quant network, whether it's GV himself or Martin Hargreaves or some of these other guys, I mentioned, it, you know, it, it's the concept of it could be used for good or evil. And of course, this is where quant gets some criticism because it's tied to the you know World Economic Forum and so on. But I don't think. It's to the point of recognizing that this is going to be used for just dooming gloom. I'm looking at it for more of a perspective of there is problems that exist in our current system. And how much will this be worth even from a broader perspective of like what it's all connected to? And it's not it just doesn't end at any particular point. When we talk about sandbox, right, what you guys have seen in regards to the Rosalind sandbox. Think about that in itself. It's not to the point where there's limitations to all this. This other part on the bottom, Rosalind experiment has advanced central bank innovation in two key areas, exploring how an API layer could support a retail CBDC system. So again, think about this part. You know, are you for, are you for or against what it mentions? What it does mention in regards to the benefit is how it could facilitate safe and secure CBDC payments, the range of different use cases. How it could also be active in collaboration with public private sectors to identify and explore their use cases and has the heart of, or has been at the heart of all this. They believe as in Qual Network that Rosalind can make a significant contribution on how organizations across the globe are thinking about engaging with the design of a retail CBDC, 
This is, of course, quoted from Francesca Hopwood Road, head of the BIS Innovation Hub of, from the London Center. Let me take you to this last part. It talks about standardized APIs that enable interoperability between old and new systems. How? They give you, you know, example. And they actually show silos, right? So, A, payment messaging model. Bank A ledger, bank B ledger. Kicks it down to bank A account, bank B account, central bank ledger. Do you have a programmable platform? Well, of course you do. What would that be? That would be the overledger. So execution environment for smart contracts, provider C, provider D ledger, non-money asset partition. And again, I'm not going to break it all down because we talked about this till we're blue in the face, but it's definitely worth pointing out. This part is also crucial. One last example from tokenizer. So look at this for a second and I'll blow this up a little bit more for you guys. And I'll just mention off the other screen to make it flow a little bit better. So what tokenizer has right here is some really good examples. And I'm going to come out of the frame for a second. We can see this a little bit better. And I'll scroll down for you can see it just a little bit, even that much more better. So here's an example of Coinbase, okay? And maybe that is a little bit too big, so I'll just jump back. Um, let's pull this back over here. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to make it, you know, that much more bigger. But you guys see this pretty well, so that's good. So on this illustration, you do see like these timestamps, February 9, 2024, Coinbase. Look at this for a second. You don't think that anything's going on with quant as far as whale money? Just think about this for a second. On February 9th, which is not that long ago, okay, about a week ago, 1,555 quant QNT was moved, right? And you can see, you know, the, the end hash in regards to the address. And it had a balance of 39,251 quant. That's a lot of quant, right? And then it says 1,656 QNT was moved to this other particular address with a balance of 26,994 quant. Now, here is what's significant. I'll go back to the other screen just to make it that much bigger. <clears throat> just in case you are Boomer F. It's here and watching from his couch. All right. So look at this for a second. And I know this is a lot easier to read. But what is significant here? Well, we always track whale activity, do we not? Well, in regards to the whale activity, because I know some of you guys just want to see like, oh, Max, I love you, bro. But... I just want to see where the big money is going. Is any big money moving in and out of QNT? The answer is yes. So both wallets, were you aware, were created on August 8th, 2021. And if anything, both wallets were at that same time. Both wallets got 20 transactions um, with this particular amount, 364 QNT. Um, and it states that this happened on also August 8, 2021. Both wallets only hold QNT and no ETH to send. Both wallets dormant for most of 2022. And both wallets reawakened when? When? Hmm? December 20, 20, December 2023, right? Some particular time in December. And who was by? It was by Coinbase. And it was by Coinbase, this particular one, Coinbase 10. That's interesting because why would they do that all of a sudden? Well, I think the reason why they do some of this is for the reasons that we've been talking about for a while. So I'm going to jump back over here. And this is, again, a tokenizer example. These Q&T whale wallets are getting active <clears throat> with Coinbase outflows again. Let me double check the screen that I'm on the right one. I want you guys to see this. So look what it says. Below, he's mapped out two withdrawals. We just showed that, totaling to 3211 QNT, which at the time that he wrote this equals out to be $327,522 done in one swift batch transaction just five hours ago. Well, again, this is um, a few days ago, right? So again, the point is the two wallets are no strangers to us. Both created on those times I mentioned before. And this means that these walls that were sent to those particular addresses had emptied their entire QNT holdings into these two wallets. I mean, I think that's a big deal. 
Since then, these two wallets have done absolutely nothing with the copious amounts of QNT they have. How so? There's an example right there on your screen. And you can see how that all works out. It all matches up and so on. But like Tokenizer says, you have to be wondering where these 40 other wallets had accumulated their QNT. Interestingly enough, they had all acquired this QNT to various wallets via Coinbase, too. It was withdrawn just four minutes before these two wallets were made. Here's the others as examples. Take a moment to look at them. But I think it is worth paying attention to. And I, this is what I love about Tokenizer. He goes the extra mile to bring us this information. Because, I mean, we can connect dots all the time. But as the saying goes, what is big money doing? You know, what are whales doing? What are exchanges in particular are you doing? Are they doing nothing? Are they moving money around? And if so, what money? And in particular, QNT. So back to the far right side, Tokenizer wants us to know this highlight. And he says, quote, so here's the full timeline of what we have discussed from when the wallets were created up into this very point with the most recent transactions. And let's get into that. Dates all the way back to August 2021. All right, you see that created. You get the first batches of QNT in these particular wallets that interacted with Coinbase 10. Then December 2021 to January 2022, both wallets, as if you're wondering where we're at, we're in the middle. Both wallets get large transfers of QNT totaling up to 6,955 QNT. I mean, I would kill for that. Not literally, but you know what I mean. Directly from Coinbase 2. And then again, the whole thing that was dormant from February 2022 to a few months back in November 2023. And then the last example, December 2023 to present. Both walls reawakened with the first deposit in December 2023 and have continued receiving QNT from Coinbase 10 since. Why is that important? Because it's the largest batch transfers yet. Yet. Again, you know, we pay attention to what's going on with, you know, ETH whales with what they're moving around in regards to ETH. And, you know, this whale wallet bought a bunch of Shiba Inu and stuff like that. But this is QNT we're talking about. So I'm glad that he brought this up. And I'm glad that he decided to share it because guess what? I do feel as though it's important. And in conclusion, what I want to share with you guys is this. So I have some key research that I wanted to get into. And of course, as you guys seen on the outline, right? We're talking about QNT, obviously BSV. My thing is this, okay? QNT with overledger fixes the TCP IP you know, problem. BSV through IPv6 solves web 3's future scaling problem while basically both are you know both these technologies are significant what stands out for quant and what stands out for example you know bsv some of the key things i want to mention to you guys just on this particular segment in regards to quant okay you have to keep in mind problem solution so quant with overledger Listen to these key three things before we wrap things up. Quant does definitely solve that problem of interoperability between different blockchains um, and the limitations of specific blockchains that we know. And the hindering communication of data in regards to what's exchanged. TCP IP, the Internet's communication protocol, doesn't translate well to, for example, blockchains. But again, Quant solves that problem. So what's the solution in regards to it, right? Because that was the problem. Overledger is a platform, whether you realize it or not, and especially if you're new, that enables communication between different blockchains and, of course, those specific networks. It acts as a translator. Again, think about the whole thing of ISO TC 307, right? It's a translator. ISO 222 it itself, right? ISO standard, also a translator through the messaging model. But ISO TC 307 does, in fact, act as a translator, converting messages between different protocols and, of course, standards, because it's a standard in itself created by Gilbert Verdian. This specifically, you guys, does allow for interoperable applications that can leverage the strengths of different blockchains. Now, why is this so crucial? Why is this so significant? Well, you've been studying the whole thing of quant for a while. 
and been listening to the coverage and, and whatnot, you will understand that Overleisure is a key player in facilitating mass adoption of blockchain tech by overcoming interoperability hurdles. QNT through the Overleisure can enable real world applications that span multiple blockchains, not just some, but we're talking about hundreds, such as supply chain management or even cross border payments. When I get into the whole thing in regards to BSV, you're going to learn if you haven't done so already, the significance of IPv6. So the key thing tonight is this, is protocols and what both of these can do to answer the problem of what existed many, many decades ago through TCP IP. And in particular, particularly, I should say, when we get to the BSV segment in regards to problem solutions, the significance for, you know, BSV. In conclusion, key point in regards to quant, because we're wrapping up the quant segment of the night. Quant does very well focus on interoperability. And as we know, it enables communication and data exchange between different blockchains. Overledger itself, like we mentioned before, acts as a translator, but specifically facilitates real world applications that span, of course, multiple blockchains. I mean, 100 plus blockchains, interoperability. So I always think that's always worth re mentioning just in case people just need that reminder. But hopefully, you guys. Appreciated some of the coverage. Um, I have coverage, uh, covered the whole thing with Embridge, and we'll do a little more of an update in that regard. But I wanted to explain this whole thing of, you know, these different tidbits because, you know, I have seen people say, well, sh why should I be involved in BSV or why should I be involved in Quant? Don't they solve the same thing? No, they don't. But they both provide a solution with their tech or problems that existed even all the way back to web one.